right, welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. Big week for IPOs. We have Airbnb and DoorDash going public. We're going to be talking about all of that, as well as what's going on with SPACs, special purpose acquisition vehicles, uh, or SPACs as they're known. Our guest today, three of the best in the business, my friends, Kathleen Smith from Renaissance Capital, who runs the Renaissance Capital IPO ETF, a basket of the last 50 IPOs. Paul Delacquia, excuse me, Paul, uh, who runs the Defiance Next Generation SPAC ETF, and Dave Nautic from ETF Trends. Welcome, everybody here. Kathleen, let me start with you. Big week for IPOs, and it is remarkable to me that IPOs have had such a stellar year, given all of the COVID madness. We've got 194 deals raising $67 billion, not even including what's going to be happening this week, the best year since 2014. Just briefly summarize... Why did we do so well this year? I think a lot of people are rather amazed about that. Well, a couple of things. We have a low interest rate environment that is very good for growth stocks, which tend to be the major constituents in the IPO market. But also we have the COVID situation, which really accelerated the move toward the digital economy and toward vaccines. So these new companies are also major constituents in the IPO market. So those two things have really accelerated the returns and the returns also are the fuel to drive the IPO issuance engine. So it's been very good for the returns on the ETF and we expect to see more opportunity with Airbnb and DoorDash. The way this index works is they become a part of it especially these large ones very soon. So we have an early, heavier weight in these new companies than most other ETFs. And congrats on the Renaissance Capital IPO ETF. Uh, 500 million now in assets under management. I know you've sort of languished around with 100 million for years and you've hit it big. And uh, not just, uh, uh, you've seen inflows, not just because the prices uh, are up. And you could, could you clarify how quickly will Airbnb and DoorDash actually go in? Assuming Airbnb goes public, say, on Thursday as a plan, how quickly would it go into the Renaissance Capital IPO ETF? It will go in sometime after five days of trading between that period and when we do the rebalance, which is happening on December 18th. And this is a transparent ETF. We will be sending out an announcement several days ahead of time about their inclusion and when they'll be included. Okay. Uh, Paul, it's been a remarkable year for SPACs uh, as well. I mean, we all know SPACs had a kind of not a great reputation a few years ago. That's changed considerably in the last couple of years. Uh, 200 SPACs raised $64 billion. It's remarkable. SPACs raised about the same amount of money this year as the IPO market did. Uh, so a, a few years ago, they were hardly on anybody's radar. Now they're, they're back. Um, why has the why have we seen this sudden sea change in the SPAC business in the last two years? What what has happened that has made SPACs an an appealing, at least to many people, alternative to IPOs? Yeah, and Bob, I, I, I agree with Kathleen too. The, the rate environment has a lot to do with I think IPOs in general, but also SPACs. And before 2017, I think you got to go back to 2012 to even recognize a name that actually derived from a SPAC, and that was Burger King back in 2012. And, and to your point, I think a lot of the names were unknown. A lot of the management teams creating SPACs were unknown. But what's happened over the last two years is you've seen some high-profile companies actually choose to IPO via SPAC. Uh, Virgin Galactic uh, being one of them, they IPO'd last year. They've got a big uh, – Space test flight coming up this week, so uh, a lot of eyes on them. DraftKings has been the big one from 2020, and anyone who's into football, fantasy sports, is the name that everyone is aware of. And Luminar Technologies, actually a, a pretty high-profile company that IPO'd last week, was also via SPAC. So you're seeing high-quality companies choose to go this route. But secondarily, and maybe even more important, it's the, it's the SPAC sponsors. You're seeing much more credible investors step into the space. And you look at a name like Bill Ackman, who's raised $4 billion for an acquisition or a SPAC. Uh, Michael Klein, who is a Citigroup executive and is a, a renowned dealmaker, is now working on his fifth SPAC. But also you're seeing very legitimate private equity firms, CPG, Apollo Group, Goldman Sachs has done a couple acquisitions. Uh, they're actually creating SPACs. And I think the way they're going to be thinking about using them on a go-forward basis as additional tools uh, is going to even – add more credibility to the space. It's going to continue growth. Um, I think those are two of the big catalysts for what you've seen in 2020. 
Dave, weigh in on this. Uh, I'm as impressed as anybody about the growth of SPACs, but we all know they, they had a sort of uh, uh, a bad reputation. Let's be blunt about it uh, up until a couple of years ago. Sure. And the basic premise still is there, Dave. It's uh, trust me, I'm famous. You know my name. I'm really famous, <laughs> right? Did I tell you I'm famous? I can raise a lot of money because, hey, I'm famous. What could go wrong with this scenario? The well, uh, trust me, yeah, I'm famous. So you know, idea. There, there's a reason why SPACs are different than IPOs. And fundamentally, SPACs let companies come to market with um, some pros and cons. They have slightly less scrutiny. Um, the amount of work it takes to get a SPAC merger done into a SPAC vehicle is simply less exhaustive than it would be if you were going through the full IPO process. On the flip side, it allows a company that perhaps doesn't have a long operating history but can say very positive and credible things about the future to actually come to market and talk about those things. Companies that come to market through uh, a SPAC merger are allowed to do things like give forward guidance. And if you've ever been through the IPO process or invested in IPOs, um, they get locked down real hard. So you don't get to ask management companies about things like, hey, what's the pipeline look like for the end of next year? You do get to do that in a SPAC. So there's reasons why it's an attractive vehicle, particularly for smaller growth companies often coming out of the private equity uh, sort of train. And I think that's what we're seeing. SPACs are becoming this vehicle for companies to go from private to private equity equity to the public markets uh, right. in sort of a, a, a long, thin line, if you will. But what can go wrong with this? I, I'm sorry to be so curmudgeonly about it. I mean, uh, the, first off, there's the obvious thing, which is not, neither SPACs nor IPOs are subject they're subject to the laws of gravity like everybody else. If the yeah. market turns south or if the economy turns south, they're not going to do as well. That's that's kind of obvious. But well, is there anything I, that worries you about SPACs that could independently cause them to dramatically underperform? We've got over 200 that are sitting out there looking yeah. for targets right now. Are they all going to outperform no, or are they going to do gonna notably be, worse or better? They're going to they're going to be winners and losers. And, and like any market that uh, is disparate. Right. Remember, a SPAC or an IPO fund is investing in all of them. They're not simply saying we're going to pick the good tech ones, but we're not going to pick this healthcare one we don't believe in. Right. So in both of these and, and that's been a great approach. I mean, I think Kathleen's funds up over 100 percent this year. It's hard to argue with the returns we've seen. But with those, you know, potential excess returns come obviously enormous risks. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that what you get in something like a SPAC or an IPO fund that's pooling these things together is sort of the last tail end of private equity, which tends to be related. So if you look at what's coming to market through SPACs, you're not seeing like a lot of utility companies come to market this way. What you're seeing is, yeah. you know, internet companies, technology companies, biotech companies, firms that are out there on the cutting edge. And with that cutting edge comes the opportunity to get cut. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Kathleen, give us a preview of 2021. Um, the IPO market is sort of certainly not going away. There's a couple of high profile names coming. Um, give us a quick rundown of four or five of them and, and when we might expect to see something. Sure. Uh, I will add that private equity and venture has had so much inflow into these asset classes that having the IPO window open and this new better vehicle for a SPAC is helping this asset class, which basically has had locked in capital and hasn't performed that well relative to owning public equity. So this is a great relief, I'm sure, for every venture capitalist and private equity firm to have these outlets for uh, finding liquidity. As far as what's well, coming up- Well, that's an up interesting point. I'd be, I'd be, be before you get to your point about 2021, that's an interesting point. So you're saying that actually SPACs are good because it it brings in other companies, but uh, and maybe lesser quality companies that wouldn't have gone public or have not been successful going public. You're saying it more SPACs actually makes IPOs look better, or am I am I well, misreading what you're saying? Well, I'm saying that it's helpful to private equity and venture. Uh, pools of capital because this is an outlet that has enabled them to find liquidity. They've pretty much only yeah. had IPOs, which are a much more discerning area of the market. So now they have this other yeah. uh, access to capital. And so that should help them. Um, from an investor standpoint, I think we have to constantly look at returns. And returns are what investors need. If a product is not producing those returns, then the product isn't of value to investors, where really the buck stops, I think. 
So yeah. um, you want yeah. to look at that and, and with a good dose of caution to make sure the IPO market just plain will shut down if returns aren't there. And that'll be true of SPACs too. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, go, so let's we, go to 2021. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's fine. We actually have, uh, we mentioned DoorDash, uh, Airbnb coming this week. We also have three other billion dollar IPOs on the calendar before the end of the year. So in uh, Roblox, we're going to see a firm and wish. And it's going to make this year a year with more billion dollar IPOs than any other year we've seen in history. So a lot of big companies are coming out. They've been private for a long time. And now they're coming out in this better market. Beyond that, in 2021, we think that Elon Musk's SpaceX may try to tap the market. We're also hearing a lot about Stripe, which has a very high private valuation, the mobile payments company, Good. Instacart, the grocery delivery company. And we think that um, uh, Alphabet's Waymo, the autonomous driving division of Alphabet, will tap the IPO market in 2021. Yeah, this is pretty remarkable. I'm wondering, uh, Paul, if you think this uh, space race or SPAC race uh, with IPOs is going to continue in 2021. Um, I spoke with BTIG the other day, and they, they said there's 210 SPACs that are out there right now seeking acquisitions. That's as many as happened last year or this year. That seems like a remarkable number. I mean, it seems unless the market turns down, SPACs are going to have at least as good a year as 2020, but what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, and we we partner with a firm called SPAC Research, so we actually have the deal flow right on our website, defiantetfs.com, that will actually show you how many SPACs are coming to market each day. And, and we're seeing, you know, two to five, uh, maybe not two to five a day, but two, three a day uh, that are coming live, and, and that's been a trend pretty much all year. So I think there's going to be um, that kind of growth going into 2021. And I want to pick up a point from Dave and Kathleen, because I think the private equity point is an interesting one for why SPACs are attractive. Because for a lot of investors, the private equity market is something they can't tap into. So if you're a smaller retail investor, smaller financial advisor, you may not have access to the best of breed private equity funds out there. What a SPAC offers up is sort of that private equity-like return. So yes, you're going to take a risk on a management team. Yes, you know you, they have to perform in order to seek those returns. But when the winners tend to win, they tend to be pretty outsized returns. So I think that's what the appeal of a SPAC is. And I think what you've seen from a return perspective from the actual SPACs and then the actual post-IPO SPACs, like, so when they've actually merged with the target, um, the, the, the winners have won in a big, big way. So, you know, you know I was thinking on the ETF, uh, exactly as Dave alluded to, you're going to have the winners in there, uh, but you're also going to have some losers. But the diversity of the ETF will hopefully keep up uh, with a return profile that's similar to a private equity-like return for investors. Yeah, but we think that. Kathleen, let me ask you about. Okay, L Kathleen, let me ask you about the IPO ETF. My my colleague in the segment I was just on on the air with her uh, asked me whether or not you would ever consider including including SMACs in the IPO ETF. Would you ever consider doing that? And if not, why not? Or is, is that a well? Is, in this current she product, asked me, I don't know. our rules say you have to be an operating company and it takes almost two years for a SPAC to turn into an operating company. So under the current uh, strategy that we have, SPACs would not be included in this index. We have, we're have we interested to see how the SPAC ETF uh, performs and the strategy behind that. Uh, I think you know maybe you're digging into some opportunity there, but our existing product is going to be purely uh, IPOs, regular way IPOs.